two, one. <laughs> Boom. What's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We have a special guest today, Mariana Sanko. What's up? How are you? Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure. I'm really excited to talk about everything that you care about. That this might be a long conversation. I care about a lot of things. <laughs> Good. Yeah, it's important to care a lot of care a lot about a lot of things, especially diverse things like you care about. Let's um, let's do it. Let's jump right into it. Yeah, wherever cool. you want to start. So you got a cool background, Masters of Material Science at Carnegie Mellon, and also some biomedical engineering in there, and then ended up going off into uh, doing some like material science work, and then and then now venture capital work and impact investing, and so this is uh, let's 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 start let's start off with like let's start off with. Like, wh how did you even decide on what you wanted to, f like, learn about? Ah, um, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm an immigrant myself and a, a, child of immig a child of immigrants, obviously. And so my, I was born in Ukraine. Um, my parents came over to the U.S. when I was quite young, and they both have advanced degrees in engineering. And they basically made me promise one thing, which is please don't become an engineer. Um, and so I was hell-bent on becoming an engineer, right? Um, my mom really wanted me to be a doctor. Uh, my dad wanted me to make lots of money. Um, and as an only child and an immigrant child, you basically handcuffed to saying, I will support you guys because you worked your butt off to make my life work. Um, but I think the thing that they uh, maybe failed in that process was that they raised me like a daughter of engineers. So my entire life was sitting on chairlifts with my dad and him pointing up at the cabling system and saying, how do you think that works? That's awesome. That's um, a good parent. Right? I and love that. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so it was a really fun experience growing up, just constantly having, being questioned about how the world works and why it works that way. And it wasn't that, honestly, I wasn't asking a lot of those questions. My parents were asking me. Uh, and that bred in me this kind of contextual reasoning of, well, wait a second, how does that thing actually work, and why, and does that actually make sense, and is it efficient? Yeah. Uh, and so that led me to have just a general interest in, in high school. I loved, uh, I loved physics, um, and the part of the world that I really, really didn't understand was materials, mm. right? It's this microscopic layer, interactions between atoms, crystal structures, polymers, and I thought, well, if there's a part of the world that I'm not going to figure out by intuition, it's this kind of underlying structure of the universe. And um, I thought material science was going to kind of be the wave of the future. And so I ended up at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, the, the intro to material science class was really compelling. They did all these fun experiments. Mm. Uh, we got to make rings out of silver. And so um, mm -hmm. I was really motivated to kind of go down that path and figure out what the world looks like on that subatomic scale, yeah. which has been an interesting yeah. ride. <laughs> yeah. I love that your dad and mom were like, you can't go into engineering. And you were like, I'm going to go into engineering. And then because you grew up with this fascination of like, are things working efficiently? How are they working? And are they efficient? Um, how can we make them better? Right. This con that continuous thought. So it's almost a, <clears throat> it's almost like seeing the world through the lens of how things are made and how they work, and then can I figure out ways to make them better? Yeah, I think I always love that experience of not really thinking about, right, there, there's so much of the world which just works and you never think about it. Like you never really think about how your refrigerator works. And then somebody actually explains it to you and you go, oh gosh, that is such an elegant design. Like that is such a clever solution. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what I really got enamored with, which is, what are really clever solutions? Because clever solutions have all these beautiful aspects to them, right? They're simple, they're elegant, they're efficient. Uh, and I think that that's the way that I think about the world. And also, you, you see these cobbled together solutions where you're like, God, really? That's the best we could do? Like that, all of those moving, like an internal combustion engine is a beautiful piece of engineering, but mm -hmm. it's also so complicated. And you mm -hmm. think there must be a better way totally. to propel, you know, all these chunks of mass around. Totally. Um, and and here so we go into the electrification. Yeah. It, to some extent, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I do think about the world on, on that prospect, which is, uh, you know, how can we push a design forward thinking in engineering to make better systems that make more sense? Um, Good. 
which is not, not a commentary that, that current systems don't work terribly well. It's that you know, the march of technology kind of keeps progressing forward. So yep. how do we push on those boundaries? Yep. Yep. That was a long-winded answer. I, I thought it was really <laughs> concise, actually, on uh, the importance of, of seeing the world and making it better. Okay. All right. So as you're looking at this layer, because this layer is really interesting. I have a buddy of mine at, down at Santa Barbara that did his uh, PhD in understanding what's actually going on at the atomic level, like how the coaster sits on the table. Right. <laughs> and I was like... And he, then he studies liquids as well, so how liquids interact with each other at that level. And that is some crazy, what is it, like hydro... Well, you have like Newtonian fluids and non-Newtonian and the, all the hydrodynamics therein. And it, I mean, what's interesting is that on a macro level, you, you can understand how a system works, but the, the further in you dig, the, the less, mm. the more it's magic to some extent, yeah. right? Because a lot of the basic principles or the classic ways in which we define physics in our understanding just change. Um, and so, like, I spent a lot of time studying magnetics in school. Mm. Uh, I had a phenomenal professor who kind of shepherded me through that process. And I always did well in the classes, but my innate feeling was, this is magic. Like, I, I have no fundamental understanding of, of why this happens and why it's consistently true. But, like, these forces exist and they operate in this particular way. And, look, we can build solid state memory out of it. Um, but it's crazy kind of when you, when you zoom the perspective up and down. Solid state memory has to do with magnetism. Yeah, so, um, I mean, this Quick is like tangent. a very, yeah, right, it's a very, very trivial point, but anytime you're reading or writing uh, onto a disk, whether it's spinning or solid, you, you basically have, um, a, you're applying a field and you're flipping bits, right? And bits just have to do with, they align in one direction under one field. And then you take the field and you take the field away, and they stay aligned, and that's how you write a zero or a one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, in uh, spinning disks, you you do that by like actually spinning, you know, a physical piece of material. Um, in solid state, it's a slightly different mechanism, but uh, a lot of the basic principles of like how do you do permanent memory storage, whether it's on tape or on a drive or some other, it has to do with how you align. Uh, magnetic fields in grain boundaries in materials. <sighs> so much that we don't know about our world. Um, and the brain's just not able to compute even half a percent of everything. All right. So, okay. Now, with your specific uh, work in material science, uh, where were you diving in immediately uh, afterward, after school? Like, Oh, um, it, my own work was was really weird and somewhat convoluted, and I, I was just so fortunate that, that Carnegie Mellon was a great school that afforded you whatever opportunity you sought out to some extent. So <coughs> I was working on these things called titanomagnetites, uh, which is a, a class of magnetic materials um, that are pretty prevalent um, on exoplanets, so on Mars, mm. um, and doing some interesting research about how those materials are created, what are their properties, are they potentially valuable for applications, <coughs> bless you, Ooh, thank you. on Earth. Uh, that weirdly led me to get involved uh, with something called the Google Lunar X Prize, mm -hmm. um, because Carnegie Mellon has an amazing robotics division, yeah. and at the time there was a team that was basically trying to put uh, more or less a tractor on the moon. Um, mm. It, to put it like, it was a rover and it was a robot, but um, there's uh, particular visions in that team. And I got really inspired by that idea. So uh, I ended up doing, um, kind of taking my own interest and excitement about materials on other planets and saying, well, actually, maybe the more interesting question is how do you get to those materials and how do you test them? So I got really inspired by this idea of, of robots on Mars and robots on the moon, um, and that drove me down a path of autonomous systems and control systems and worrying about how we're going to go put um, interesting research in really dynamic, caustic, challenging environments without putting people at risk and at harm. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's kind of how yeah. I slowly made this transition 
not necessarily away from material science, but my interest in, in materials and where materials originated from led to me thinking about, well, how do we actually get to those places? Um, and mostly I wanted to get out of lab. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, right, you breathe a lot of chemicals in a lot of these labs, whether they're uh, wet chemistry labs or material science labs, and you start thinking, man, if I ever have children, they're going to have tails uh, because of all the chemicals I've been breathing in. So um, I, think, I think my own... My own passions uh, and my own desire to like be outside and collect a little bit more vitamin D um, made me want to get out of lab and a little bit more into field work. Yep. So then it was wondering how materials would interact on exoplanets. Yeah, I mean. And uh, then you know, the transition to robotics. Yeah, I think how so. How those I, would be on exoplanets. Yeah, if I, if I look in, in hindsight, I, I, could, I could draw that line. In reality, I was inside a pinball machine, right? Because oh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, that's, that's what life is in, you know, in your early 20s, where you're curious, excited about a lot of things, have no idea which one of those you know, will prove fruitful. Um, and honestly, I, I remember experiencing a lot of jealousy around people who had this single-minded passion in a particular area, right? I had, I had friends who were studying math um, and maybe even a particular subset of math. And it was just obvious that they were going to go on to PhDs and be very successful. And they were so single-mindedly excited totally. about a particular field of study. And I was never like that. I was always... Yeah, me too. Right? Like a, a yeah. mile wide uh, and shallow as a baking pan in all of mm -hmm. them. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so um, I'd love to say that I studied material science and biomedical engineering and those two things tied together to robotic. But like, the reality is um, I was like a squirrel. And every time I saw a shiny object that I thought was interesting, that was the direction that I turned, mm -hmm. um, which uh, I've been fortunate enough that that's worked out in my favor. Yeah. Uh, but at the time it was, yeah, well, yeah. Uh, I, I wish I could um, be a true polymath in terms of having that level of, of technical competency across those spaces. but. Um, certainly in terms of overall excitement and interest. Yeah. So then, okay, so then the work in autonomous starts and yeah. in, in robotics starts. Okay, so tell us about this. Um, so, so this is kind of a funny thing. So uh, I was finishing up school around uh, 2010, uh, so eight years ago, and this was right after the DARPA Grand Challenge uh, grants where it went from you know a handful of university students across some of the top universities saying, "Let's just build a driverless car," you know, without a lot of vision about you know why. And it certainly wasn't. I don't think anybody in their head said you know this is the spawn of the future driverless car market that hopefully will exist. Um, it was people trying to solve a really really hard problem because they were excited about it. And for me, I thought that this was really interesting because I'm a little bit of a motorhead. Like, I love cars, I love motorcycles, I love things that go fast and have the chance of hurting you. Um, and the things that I realized is that I love those things because they're fun, but mobility in terms of actual commuting is terrible and dangerous. And the reason it's so dangerous is because nobody's paying attention because it's not fun. Um, and so I believe in human out of the loop autonomy in the sense that humans are really, really bad at, at kind of consistent, repetitive tasks. Like we stop paying attention entirely, right? Totally. I mean, how many times have you driven somewhere and been like, how did I get here? Totally, the... totally. Right, we go on autopilot and when humans are on autopilot, it's terrible. Mm -hmm. And the more I learned about robotics and robotic control systems and consistent closed loop controls with feedback mechanisms, I was like, that's a much better way to control a system that is doing essentially the same thing with a handful of corner cases. Um, and so for me, it wasn't incongruous about this idea of, of wanting driverless cars to exist and also still loving motorcycles, because I thought, you know, humans should spend more time doing things that are fun that they're actually present to, mm -hmm. and less time doing terrible, dangerous things that they don't even want to be present to, because yeah. nobody's paying attention when they're sitting in traffic. Yeah. Um, and so I, for me, it was such a natural flip. Like when I saw that transition happening and the technology maturing and, you know, a bunch of college and graduate students actually being able to build a car that drove around a city block autonomously, I was like, oh, this is the future. 
And this was at a time where everyone was like, this is never going to happen. People want to own cars. This was when uh, car companies were still saying, we'll never go autonomous because we care about the drive experience. Right? And now they're all mobility companies. Um, so it, for me, that flip was so obvious. And I thought about it across all contexts, right? from uh, aviation, which already has a lot of autopilot, to um, cars, to in general, like what are tasks that we're doing as people because we're used to it, but where technology is actually caught up and can kind of take over the wheel. I like how you're uh, very adamant about human being out of the loop because we don't really pay that much attention to the process. <coughs> And not only is that true that we're not paying that much attention to the process, but then we have emotion and sleep deprivation and sometimes we're intoxicated, we're trying to eat, we're trying to do this in the car, all these different things. And what better way than to take the human completely out of the loop, hopefully completely soon, that we'll actually get to that point. And then if you want to drive, then you're you'll have to pay more, your insurance, or something will happen to your insurance. And, sure. Um, okay, so human out of the loop, um, and, and the being with the actual uh, DARPA challenge, yeah? Yeah, I, I, um, I got to know the team at Carnegie Mellon that was working on it. A lot of that team was working on the Google Lunar X Prize uh, that I was more directly involved with. Um, and so I, I can't cool. take credit for really any of the phenomenal advances, um, but I was definitely hanging around uh, with that group of with that group of people and, and continue to be inspired by them. And then where does where do you go after that then? Um, I how'd you make it out here? Yeah, right. What yeah. happened? Uh, it's a good question. It, it, I, I had the good fortune of joining a startup early. Uh, right out of school, uh, learned a lot of the, the challenges. Uh, we kind of talked about the um, uh, entrepreneur's dream and trials. Uh, and so I, it was a great deal of fun being in an early engineer uh, at a very, very early company. We struggled from a lot of things, uh, which I think as a, as a VC these days, uh, I maybe have more compassion uh, and empathy than I would otherwise if I hadn't been through that experience. Um, but it was, it was a challenging, it was a challenging place uh, and it was challenging because we didn't quite know how to fund it or how to build a meaningful business that was self-sustaining. Uh, and I think if you actually want to build technology that's viable, the business case has to close. Like you, you can't just keep kind of pouring gasoline in, into bad ideas and hoping that they eventually become economically viable, right? Yeah. True, true sustainability yeah. has to, by nature, be, be economically viable. Um, and, and that wasn't necessarily the case in some of the early projects that I was involved with. Uh, and so I ended up as a, as a research engineer in a larger materials company and had this, had this cons kind of consistent feeling that there was a translation layer that was missing between technical people who were trying to build interesting product, products and the strategy people who I never quite understood what they were doing, but every time they came and talked to us, I was like, you guys actually don't know what's going on in these labs. And it's not because you're not intelligent people, it's because you're just not spending enough time on the ground floor. Um, and I started thinking about, well, who are these consultants who come in and tell us how we should run our businesses and who are these uh, strategy and MBAs who kind of you know show up and tell you what research you should be focused on and how these markets work. Um, because my experience um, on, on the kind of build side of that was, I'm not sure you guys know what you're talking about, right? Because the, the, like, that's not the timeline we operated on, that's not how much this is gonna cost, and also, like, have you actually validated that anybody wants this stupid thing we're trying to build? Um, and so I, I thought about it for a while uh, and ended up at a place called Lux Research, which was just a phenomenal uh, education in the sense that I, was, I became a market analyst and a consultant, and it was like somebody paying me to get a, an MBA, essentially. Uh, and I had the good fortune of working with incredible clients there, like you know, tier one automotive suppliers, um, OEMs, original equipment manufacturers, to large chemical and materials companies, pharma companies. And all of them had these questions, which is like, 
what is the future of robotics? What is the future of autonomy? How does these things accept our, you know, change our business practices? How do our own divisions have to change? What a cool job. Yeah, it was a super fun job. It was an amazing job. Um, the challenge is you never, you, you got to make a lot of recommendations and travel a bunch and speak. It, I mean, it was, it was an enormous amount of fun. Um, the problem was that if you're uh, an opinionated and obsessive person like I am, it's really, really challenging to kind of pour your heart into some work product and then hand it over to somebody and watch them read it and basically ignore it or throw it in the trash or say, like, you know, pat you on the head, say, thank you so much for doing this and we're, we're going in a totally different direction. Um, and I realized that I was so passionate about some of the things that we were doing. And a lot of our focus was looking at how early, very, very early startups were going to disrupt these large industries. Um, and I thought that, you know, Somebody who lives in this translation layer should make sure that these startups are getting funded. Because even if these big companies are going to continue ignoring them, they're just going to kick their butts. Mm -hmm. um, and so well, that's basically how I fell into venture capital. What were some of the small companies that were coming up and that were dealing with the uh, larger equipment manufacturers? Um, let me think about it. So, so I obviously can't share uh, names. Uh, but uh, a great example is I remember a company, one of my clients called me and said, hey, I heard about these guys, Cruise Automation. Uh, can you just go like, call them and see what's up? And so I, I got on the phone um, and I talked to a couple of people at Cruise, uh, Kyle Voigt included. And you know, at the time when I spoke to them, they were retrofitting uh, cars with autonomy. And they couldn't get into the drive-by-wire system, so they were literally putting actuators under the pedals. <laughs> um, and I asked them, like, how do you train this in the rain? And I think they more or less answered, well, it's Southern California, so it doesn't rain that much, so we don't, you know. So it, was, it was very much like scrappy, early startup. You thought these guys were crazy. Um, if you trained in the school of kind of robotics that I did, you, were, you looked at them and said, you guys are reckless. However, I, I remember writing this in, in kind of my write-up afterwards. I was like, these guys are nuts. They're a little bit reckless. But I also think they're brilliant and that you really should pay attention, um, yeah, yeah. particularly because the leadership staff here is just somewhat mindlessly passionate about this space, so I would not discount them. And two, they've pulled enough really clever team, like team members together that you guys need to either pay attention very, very early and maybe be a little bit worried. Um, right, fast forward, uh, I think not even five years later, they were acquired for like the better part of a billion dollars uh, by GM. Yep, um, boom. And uh, I can share that GM was not the company that called me asking about them. Yeah. Uh, and the company that had called asking me about them was like, kind of read my report and were like, oh, you know. Not, not, nothing to pay attention to. Uh, and then uh, proceeded to scramble after the fact to try to catch up in a lot of totally. interesting ways. Um, and so I think there were a lot of experiences like, like that, that where totally. uh, they kind of called and either said, you know, what have you seen that's interesting? And you respond and say, well, oh, you care about collaborative robots? Well, there's actually like a bunch of these companies out there and they're doing really interesting work. And whether it's Rethink Robotics or Universal or any of these others, and a lot of them said, meh, you know, too small of a market, not going to affect our bottom line, not a problem. Um, and they might have often been right, but, you know, if you zoom out to a long enough time scale, uh, if, they, if they had acted at the point in which they originally cared, they'd be way better off. I wonder how many of these examples exist, especially here in Silicon Valley, of people analyzing companies and seeing, like, they're still really small, they're a little, a little scrappy, they're, they're passionate, but they are not really putting the right things together yet. And then you like pass along these reports and people look at them and then they're just like, holy shit, they blew up a couple months or a year or whatever later. So um, it seems to be that electrification is now becoming huge. Um, China rolled out like 15,000 buses in Shenzhen that are all electric and they have like 50 uh, electric car companies. So that's some big progress for them. I mean, versus us where 
I don't even know city, any cities that have only electric buses. Uh, I don't off the top of my head either, although that's, that's probably just a lack of education on my part. I'm, I'm certain that we, we are making pushes in those spaces. You know, I, I think it's been hard for the car companies for a long time, just because if you look, you know, sell, what, like 100 million new cars a year worldwide, 100,000 of which are Teslas or, or electric cars as a whole. So, right, the, the overall percentage of electric vehicles sold to so net small. vehicles sold is, is so minuscule small that you think, and these guys have the production lines and the capability and the capacity that you think, well, you know, when when the market shows true interest, then the cars will show up. The pro electrification is fundamentally a challenging um, conversation to have because there's two axes on which to consider it. First is the overall lifetime cost of the vehicle, which you could argue from a maintenance perspective with an electric vehicle, it's just a much simpler, right? A motor is more simple, is far simpler than an engine. Uh, hybrids are weird because it's actually like the worst of both worlds in terms of needing to care for both systems. Um, but pure electric versus pure combustion. The flip side is that uh, if you're just trying to calculate your like net CO2 carbon output, um, you're not necessarily better off with an electric vehicle, right? So if you, it really depends on where your electricity comes from. So mm. if you buy an electric car in New York, where a lot of the electricity is still powered by pretty, I should, I should be careful about naming states because I, I don't know these numbers off the top of my head, but I have seen graphs that uh, basically do uh, kind of global reports of where does your uh, raw, raw electricity come from, right? Is it coal powered? Is it water, hydroelectric, whatever? Uh, and that totally changes the equation, right? So in yeah. California, you're actually pretty well off mm -hmm. um, because most of our electricity is reasonably clean. But there's massive swallows of the world where you're not doing the world any great good other than patting yourself on the back for driving an electric car. Um, and that's one of the challenges was just, it's not about what you do so much as what do you do on a grid level scale. Um, yeah, so plugging your car in and getting electrical power from fossil fuels um, pretty terrible. Pretty terrible versus just filling up the car with gasoline that's a combustion engine and driving that. Is actually more efficient. <clears throat> it is actually more efficient? Well, it's more, uh, so efficient is a weird word. Um, it is cleaner in the sense of um, greenhouse gas emissions. It's cleaner. Interesting. Okay, now how about, how about when the car is being is using solar or wind um, for its energy for electric power. Okay, so that's clean energy. Then what about the cost of replacing the battery? Um, what do we do with the battery afterward? Yeah. Yeah, I, right, these are, these are big questions, um, especially second life batteries for automotive, right? So we start producing all these car batteries. Um, batteries are still only so good and they're not really as good as we'd like them to be and once you you can't realistically drive a car once the battery has gone through a lot of deep discharges because it just loses efficiency right and so you need to replace your battery far more often than you think you would mostly because it, it its efficiency drops off so much once it's gone through a lot of cycles particularly if they're really deep discharges um, and this just has to do with the chemistry so people are trying to make the chemistry better on the reusable side, people, uh, I've seen business plans for people who are trying to, um, you know, take these batteries out of cars and use them for second life to like put them on robots so they're little mobile charging stations because who cares if that battery is a little less efficient. Um, it, I think we'll see what happens. Um, to some extent, it's a chicken and egg problem uh, that there's not that many electric cars on the road or vehicles as a, electric vehicles as a whole on the road, uh, so what to do with the Second Life batteries isn't that big of a problem. But it's, it's kind of like the nuclear energy problem, right? Like, we worry about nuclear waste from nuclear energy plants and what on earth we're going to do with it, but only at a scale when those plants actually show up totally. and are well distributed. And so I, I think people are worrying about it and starting to think about it. Um, there's not that much of a market for it today. Uh, nor is that that much supply. Um, Just don't want them to go into landfills. That's right. Uh, and I think that 
I would love to see more projects about um, you know, better recyclability and reuse uh, and, and economically viable reuse. Um, because it's one of these things, if you're putting more energy in to get these betters out and use them for some other use case, like, I don't know, maybe you're better off just storing them until we figure out how to recycle them. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's one thing that I've always been thinking about now with electrification is, ooh. No? Okay. All good. Um, so, okay. So, with electrification, I'm thinking a lot about like the cost of actually the recycling of the battery and of where the energy comes from, and this is all really important. And then I'm wondering about like what's going to be the next step after that, and I think that maybe understanding um, nuclear fusion is a really interesting step after that. Um, I would really like to figure out how to fuse atoms and and get more energy out of it than we put into it and then be able to power things with that. That sounds so appetizing and so abundant and then we'll, um, we'll be good forever. But and this kind of gets us into a little bit of the quantum world that you're interested in as well. Um, so maybe tell us about your interest in quantum computing, quantum mechanics, because that's where we met. We met at a cool... Yeah, we met at a dinner event. party about quantum computing, yeah. uh, because that's San Francisco in a nutshell for you. I was like, yeah. what are you doing on a Thursday night? Oh, I was quantum computing dinner. It's, yeah. This is a ridiculous place to live, um, and lovely for a lot of reasons. Like, I totally love it. I agree. Um, and, and a shout out to our good friends at, at 50, 50 years. Year yeah. BC, who, who do put on these lovely dinner parties for yeah. us. Um, I mean, my interest in, in quantum computing is is trivial to some extent, which is that, um, you know, Moore's Law, we've been doubling uh, the number of transistors and reducing the cost of computing uh, for the better part of the last 50 years. And quantum computing is hopefully the next step in that process. Uh, and, and nobody really knows what that transition looks like, right? We went uh, CPUs, GPUs, now we're talking about TPUs. Then there's What's kind of TPUs? Uh, tensor tensor processing, processing yeah. units. Um, uh, Google's put out some really for interesting papers. TensorFlow. Yeah. Google's deep learning. Right, and so the idea is, um, are there chips that are uniquely, are, are there architectures, frameworks um, that are particularly well suited to doing uh, some level of neural net computation, whether it's b better matrix multiply or some fundamentally yeah. better approach to to making. Um, to making some of these hard problems, honestly, just faster to solve and to converge on solutions. Uh, and that is kind of the promise of quantum computing, right? Is yeah. that you... QPUs. Right, QPUs, right? This, I don't know, there's some space between TPUs, some mess of future computing, and then QPUs. Um, and the, the beauty of QPUs is that theoretically um, you you can solve all sorts of challenging optimization problems by it, you know, doing a lot of hard work and translating them into a form that a quantum, that a quantum algorithm can you know, take to the quantum processing unit uh, and arrive much faster at the lowest energy solution because the electrons will tunnel their way um, and, and land at the, the most likely solution set of the problem space. There's a lot of challenges with that, right? Which is like, how do you actually qualify um, that you're in the actual true solution and not trapped in some local minimum or a maximum? Um, I think that should back up. Yeah, so that I no, can, so it's I can, a fair point. But so, so I think the short answer is, I care a lot about quantum computing in the simple reason that it's, it's the next transition of faster, better computing. And yeah. every time we get faster, better computing, people push a lot of interesting things forward. Um, and China's and, like 10 billion in. Yeah, and people in, are pummeling like stupid amounts of money into this, right? Because um, it's really important. Right, DFJ invested in a quantum annealing system uh, more than a decade ago. Which I don't Z even think we said that you were at Airbus here <laughs> That's right. uh, two yeah, years so, ago and now. Right, so yeah. I, I started, um, I kind of fell into venture capital as an investment partner at Airbus, uh, focused on uh, aerospace, aviation, robotics, deep space. 
Airbus is these massive your A three eighties that are flying around. That's and, right. Yeah, with yeah. like uh, how many people? Like a thousand people in a in a plane, like eight hundred, something like that. A lot of people. A lot of people. A lot of people, people trapped it's the, together. It's the ones you. Yeah, it's the ones that you the fly double internationally. Double deckers. Yeah, yeah. They're beautiful the, aircraft. I, and then they have like those great Rolls Royce engines that are just insanely powerful and. Yeah. Um, they're just like, they're great aircraft. They're just made really well. And uh, we're really blessed to be able to fly around internationally in those. And so their venture arm, I will get back to quantum computing. Don't you worry. Um, um, uh, uh, I'm quick, happy to go down lots of rabbit holes. We, we will. Let's go down the, let's go down the Airbus Ventures one quick. Yeah. What was their, what was their, what was their shtick? Like they're, I mean, they're like, like Dubai or like Emirates, like bought, a bunch of uh, Airbuses, like the most in the world. They have like right. like 500 Airbuses versus like the other airlines only have like 100 or something or less. Uh, I mean, I don't know the the finer points of these contracts. Uh, but what do you mean? What was their strike in what What's sense? their shtick with, because um, <clears throat> the French, yeah. And the German. And German. And Spanish. And, and Spanish. British. And British. Interesting. So, um, <laughs> but Airbus is based in France. Uh, so it's, um, it's a multinational corporation. Uh, mm. It's headquartered in Toulouse, France, but it, uh, there are central European governments that have uh, controlling shares. And so... Where did they manufacture? Uh, so it's a mix. So uh, okay. large portions of the aircraft are, are made in Germany. Uh, parts are made in the UK. There's big manufacturing lines in... Um, Spain, final assembly, so the final assembly line, the FAL, is in Toulouse. Um, there's also cool. Airbus Americas, which has manufacturing in like Alabama. I want to um, go to the FAL, the, f yeah, the final FAL. assembly yeah. line. I want to go incredible. there. It's incredible. Yeah, it's probably a massive hangar. Yeah, and there's a bunch of them. And so you, yeah. you walk in and you, you see these, I mean, you see full aircraft being assembled and the wings being press fitted in. Oh, like, this is, they're massive. Yeah. Oh, that'd be so cool to go check that out. I have to go look that up. Okay, so then they're making like, you know, they, they're making some, these are the international planes of today. Like they're the- They're, they're the, also national, right? So JetBlue uh, flies primarily, uh, oh, you or maybe not primarily, smaller right? So yeah, planes? so there's um, A320 is like one of the most common aircraft that you'll fly on today. And that's like a- 300, 400, 500 seater. Yeah, you know when you get in your like uh, two, you know, single aisle aircraft, uh, two to three seats on each on row, side? right? So, um, I would say that you know Boeing and Airbus are your two major aircraft manufacturers. There's a couple others out there, but for every Boeing aircraft, there's kind of an Airbus equivalent and vice versa. Okay, uh, so Airbus is actually has a couple different levels. Yeah, it's of, got the yeah. full stream of commercial. But also remember, Airbus is a much bigger company than. Commercial aircraft is, I think, the, the kind of brand name uh, of Airbus, but there's also Airbus Defense and Space, which is a cool. massive defense organization. They do that as well. Yeah, and then there's... Um, they don't make fighter jets, though, right? They do. They make Yeah, the Eurofighter. They make a Eurofighter? Yeah, it's a really cool aircraft. Uh, and a bunch of... Mil and then there's Airbus Helicopters, which is uh, one of the largest helicopter manufacturers ever. And they sell a lot of helicopters as well? Yeah, so a mix of... Uh, um, military and, and non-defense. It's um, crazy. Okay, so yeah. um, we were, you were just at a VTOL. Um, I was. Uh, VTOL yeah. being vertical takeoff and landing. Yeah, and, yeah. that's exciting. I want to see if we can touch on that maybe along the way. But, um, well, maybe let's do it now, and then we'll talk about the Airbus investing, and then we'll get back to quantum computing. But um, what's, the, the, like, what's the future of VTOL? It seems like uh, it seems like that Elon's digging holes in the ground and it's like, it kind of makes sense, right? But at the same time, um, you know, you don't want, like they're saying, like you don't want a hubcap to fall off and just like chop someone's head off. So, um, and there's like obviously all of the complexities of the plane above us versus below us. So um, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, so, so Elon has the boring company um, literally digging tunnels uh, that will pull a vacuum and then we'll have ultra fast rail through there. But they're pretty fixed paths, right? It's, it's basically a, a really, really fast train underground. Um, and we have on land, we have, you know, electric scooters and bicycles and cars and light rail and trains and heavy rail and ships and containers. So we have like this whole spectrum of mobility 
Uh, and then we have aircraft, right? And generally aircraft, like what is the shortest flight you're reasonably gonna take? Probably an hour, yeah. like here to LA, a couple yeah. hundred miles. But the challenge is that we sit in traffic all day long. Like I live in Mountain View and we're in San Francisco right now. And so if there's no traffic, it probably takes me 45 minutes. In traffic, like, I don't know, it can be two hours. It can be a disaster to get here. Um, but what if there was a business case in which somebody said, I can always get you from San Jose to San Francisco in 20 minutes? Like, how do you do that? Well, you could dig a really, really big hole uh, and pour in a ton of money into infrastructure, or you could fly short hop planes where you just need landing zones, and you know, how hard is that? Um, and so I, I think the, the excitement of the VTOL market, and I would say that there's more hype than reality and more money than sense in the market to some extent, is people saying, wait a second, we know how to do autopilot, we know how to make aircraft reasonably cheaply, uh, and we know how to do light aircraft that are electric that can fly these medium-sized routes. Um, so is there a market for consistently flying between places like San Jose to San Francisco or through downtown LA or through Jakarta or Mexico City or any of these basically densely packed urban areas? Um, there's challenges in that space, which is you know, aircraft are loud. Um, people really are really loud. afraid of them. <laughs> they are afraid of them? I mean, you know, I, I think a lot of people have like a very visceral reaction to getting into a fully autopiloted aircraft and also like we don't really know sure. how to certify that. Um, well, helicopters are loud, that's for sure. Helicopters are really loud. But, but at the same time, uh, maybe adding four propellers instead of one might quiet it, quiet it down a little. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, so, so I think that companies like Joby Aviation, uh, which recently uh, raised a large round, um, of funding for kind of it, its net, you know, they're flying a, a full scale prototype and, and they've done a lot of work to make their vehicle uh, reasonably quiet. Um, I think Vahana. The time saving is huge, like you said. Right. So it's this, it's this, it's always a calculation, right? Uh, and it's the calculation of cost, convenience, time, mm -hmm. right? And everyone is willing to make different sliding levers. Do you think that. it's going to go towards VTOL or boring? Underground or above ground? Hmm. I, I, I think if you can do autonomy, I think if you, if you can find a path to have certifiable autonomy for aircraft, um, I think it takes less infrastructure and build out to rapidly scale <sighs> totally. a lot of VTOL aircraft Agreed. than dig yeah. a lot of holes. Totally. That said, I think there are areas which consistently have bad wind or tons of rain or poor visibility, um, or totally. you just need to translate. Like, like in LA, boring might be way better because maybe there's just a lot more people who are always traveling. On the, it, it's about like population density and mm -hmm. consistency of route, right? Yeah. So if you can have efficiency of like a ton of people need to get from A to B, mm -hmm. dig a hole. Um, but if you want a multifaceted, layered, more, um, I guess, freedom of route choice than maybe aircraft, I, I don't know that it's one or the other. Yeah, yeah, totally. Both could live at the same time. Um, exactly, in different use cases that are b better. I just, I'm, I, always, I always wonder what what we what are we building today that's going to be archaic tomorrow or in a year or whatever that's a great question because like why are we wasting our time building these things for these short-term gains that are right yeah. i just want to say i just want to add you know teletransportation is the way to go <laughs> you know as soon as we uh fix the whole fly thing you know yeah. we're, we're 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 rolling i don't even know why you guys are talking about this uh. you know the hyperloop or the uh, yeah. vertical takeoff and landing. Fascinating, but uh, you know, let's get on the teletransportation conversation. And, uh, yeah, I don't think teleportation is gonna happen anytime. Yeah, there you go, I'm sure you don't. I'm sure you <laughs> I don't, think, yeah. I don't think we're on Cause, a cause you're not a big thinker, thing. yeah, I know. You're only I'm limited. I'm not a big thinker, I'm very, yeah, I'm, I'm very uh, low into the ground. Um, no, but I, I actually think about that question a lot. And for me, the space that I've landed that, that I've had a fundamental shift about that is food. Um, and specifically what we eat and how we make what we eat. Like, I, I fundamentally believe that in 20 years we're going to look back at the meat industry and go, are you serious? We grew those poor animals in those conditions 
um, in such an inefficient system and ate them and packaged it in grocery stores and were happy with that? Like, that's crazy. Yeah, I, yeah, totally. I hope we do. I hope we do. I hope we get there. I hope we get there even faster. It's our 15 minute timer. <laughs> so, um, Okay, so we, I mean, we're segueing into future food now. I still want to do at least a bit on quantum um, computing. Maybe we do food since we're already here. Um, on, the food, on the food side of things, besides looking back and being like, holy shit, that was so archaic, the way that we grew and consumed animals. Um, what else are you most looking forward to with future food? Um, I think I'm looking forward to... I think one like malnutrition on a global scale yeah. is one of the it's a primary driving factor in terms of if you look in uh, people's ability to withstand uh, disease and pathogens and challenges like in Africa like you know the the better access to consistent nutrition that people have the more likelihood they have of surviving any number of challenges that are thrown their way and so I think that um, while it's challenging, obviously, to solve global hunger, uh, we are moving into a state where our Earth is changing, temperatures are rising, agriculture is changing. And so I think a lot about how do we continue feeding the Earth's growing population in a consistent manner, um, addressing malnutrition, and how does science and cell cultivation and better growth practices enable us to grow better food. And I think this is one of the challenges, right? Like if you read Michael Pollan's books, he basically says that like, you know, people cook at home far healthier meals than corporations cook for them. Yeah. Um, as a venture capitalist who invests in companies, startups that hopefully eventually are very successful and become corporations, like how can we flip that script? How can we think about how do corporations grow and make food that doesn't suck? Yep. Um, and so I think a lot about that, and, and I get really excited about you know what are what are the ways that whether it's artificial intelligence, machine learning, better cell cultivation that helps us make our food more reasonable um, yep. and hopefully cheaper and more accessible, without just throwing away all of the nutritional right because right now like the reason that food is terrible is because sugar and fat and corn syrup are really cheap. So how do you make cheap nutritional food? Yeah. Yeah, hopefully planting large fields of spinach and blueberries and having robots harvest them, ship them off to us. Maybe, or vertical farming, or you know, growing meat in more of a cell cultivation um, situation that uh, yep. is more efficient, I think. Yep. I think there's a lot of avenues that, are, that I'm keen to explore. Yeah. yeah, because food is something that we do three times a day across the world, and malnutrition is something we've talked about on the show before as well. Pe people's brains don't have the, um, the right energy for being able to have neurogenesis or even just compute their environments and make good decisions and get enough of the nutrients for their growth, especially when they're um, being raised into the world. So that's a big deal. I think still a billion people in the world that have some sort of um, malnutrition. If not more, yeah. yeah I'm sure it's more than a billion. Just a lot of, yeah. a lot of dumb people, Marcus. Not, you know, I'm one of them, though. So, I'm just saying, a billion. Come on, it's right down the middle. I don't know if it, I don't know if it's exactly that high. It's um, it's a lot, and so is uh, access to clean water as well. It's very uh, high, around a billion as well. I think it is a billion two on food, and then 800 million on clean water. It's something like that. So. Um, so yeah, good, good on future food. There's yeah, there's a there's there's a lot to do in that in that sector, um, and it's too bad that high fructose corn syrup and fat and sugar and all this shit is just so salt. It's just also um, you totally do cook better food for yourself at home. Um, yeah, we're hosting Michael Pollan on yes. the, on the sixth of June. Oh, excellent! I look forward show. to that. Yeah, it'll He's be a lovely. good show. He's he is very lovely. Um, it'll be at the Mission Bay Conference Center. It's sold out. It's fun. Um, so, okay. Now let's 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 see if we can do the Cliff Notes version of this. 
and you teach me along the way. I'll see if I can do this. So, <laughs> okay, so initial computation um, is, is, the, is, the elect is the electricity flowing through the transistor that says one or zero that goes on or off? How does that first part work? That's in, the CPU. In a classical? In a classical, yeah. Um, I don't know that we want to like spend the last far? 10 minutes of our okay, <laughs> time okay. together going, uh, look, I think the, the basic thing to consider is in computation, you have energy coming in from like a wall, yep. right? And pumping yep. into some compute system yep. that is trying to solve a problem set. Yep. Um, now, one of the challenges is that a lot of classically hard problems like uh, Monte Carlo simulations, optimizations, they don't, they're, they're difficult to translate um, into a compute architecture that can crunch through it very quickly, right? This is actually why encryption works. It's not that encryption is all that foolproof. It just takes so much energy to potentially brute force break an encryption that it's not computationally worthwhile, right? It's too costly to, to break RSA encryption today. Um, and so what you think about with quantum computers is, is there a class of problems that when translated to a quantum computing system are much more efficient to solve, right? So can you now suddenly run uh, these algorithms in parallel? Can you break up the problem in a way that the natural architecture of the quantum computer solves the problem much faster? Uh, with less computational cost. Right? So energy comes from the wall. How do you solve the computational problem as quickly as possible? That's right. And then um, comp normal computer architecture just is like two-dimensional and then... Yeah, so most of it's like matrix multiply today and, and often the question is, you know, are you running, um, are you running it in kind of a, a, a classical metric? Can you parallelize these problem sets? Parallelize, so have different cores computing? That's right, right. Um, and can you, you know, can you basically spin up more and more cores? Uh, and can they do, can they, can they break up the problem in a way that when you actually parallelize the problem, it is more efficient, Facet. right? Because there's some, there's some problems Questions where that, like- that's you, not efficient. That's not that efficient then, or, or solving it in parallel doesn't get you that much further down the path. And how is quantum different than parallel compu computation, so, breaking it up into parallel? So, so quantum computing is, is just, it's weird and you should have some, right? You we're should get Will, Will saying- Yeah, yeah we're gonna have him um, on the show later You this should month. get Will to, to come on and, and walk you through the, the technical bits, and there are different ways yeah. to do it, right? So there's quantum annealing systems, there's full quantum systems, um, and each of them are, are suited to a class of problems. But but just the cliff notes, energy but the, from the, the wall. The very to... cliff notes is that uh, there is a way that you could construct a problem um, in terms of translating it into a quantum algorithm that a quantum computer process basically says, I can ingest this algorithm, the data you've given it to me, and I can spit out the lowest energy solution. And that kind of like tunnels through what was otherwise a massive brute force calculation. Okay, okay, that's still that's, that's super, super, super surface level, <laughs> very difficult to even, you know, um, get what is going on in there. But so it's a translation into a quantum algorithm and a quantum process, and then that can tunnel through faster than can just separate onto a bunch of cores and try that. Okay, all right, so th this is for future conversation with, you know, with Will Zang or other people from Rigetti or D-Wave and all these different companies that hopefully we'll feature on the show. We'll talk whole episode on quantum computing, but thanks for the surface level. <laughs> okay, run you through a quick, um, a couple of these simulation gamuts that we usually ask. I'm gonna smash these two questions together. They have to do with in wealth inequality and globalization. Mm -hmm. So how do we figure out how to work together through across all the borders around the world, as well as how do we um, figure out how to um, really help move everybody forward, no matter what socioeconomic status they're on? Yeah, um, not a trivial question. I, I think for me, it's on, on three fronts. Um, I think if you enable better, cheaper, safer, more efficient mobility for people, that drives upward socioeconomic mobility. Um, because right now people live in expensive city centers and rich people live there and that's like a lot of the drive of urbanization and poorer people move further and further out because they get displaced but the jobs are still centrally located, right? And so their, their lives get skewed. Um, and so the more that you can enable people to live 
in the style that they prefer and that best suits them and enable better mobility, I think that drives a lot of opportunity. Yeah. Um, I think access to uh, basic, basic resources in terms of nutritional food and water um, to the point of, you know, that improves cognition. Uh, and I think you have to start with uh, basically better access to nutritional food in schools. Yeah. Um, and I think the third bit is actually, um, and I think this, this stems from the fact that I come from Eastern Europe and there's like a whole class of um, questions around governance and uh, social freedom and can you, be, can you trust your centralized government or not. Yeah. Um, I think we are moving into a world uh, because of the internet and social media where we exist in digital tribes and those kind of live beyond our government borders. And I think that that is actually pushing a lot of good things forward in the world, right? Because if you live in a very socially constrained environment and you feel very alone because you're gay or because you don't fit in the constraints of whatever society you exist in, but you can have access to social media and you know, whatever your digital community is, um, that, gives, that empowers you as an individual to act in your systems and kind of push those boundaries. Um, and I think it is creating, uh, I hope, a more, if not peaceful, accepting and compassionate world. And I think we see that in each subsequent generation because the more we're exposed to our differences, the more tolerant we are of them. I hope. <laughs> so, uh, right, so the short is uh, mobility, food, and kind of digital connections to, to get us out of our rabbit holes. Those are really good. Yeah. <laughs> are they? I don't know. I think so. Those are, no, I think you those know are the things I worry about. So. Yeah. Or at least I try to find ways to, to protect and make better. Yeah. No, this is especially um, bringing people closer to information highways. Right. Getting them access and getting them closer and um, also just location agnosticism will be great in the future. Exactly. Because uh, right now so many people spend their time in commutes and... Exactly. Like, I think everybody freaks out about this future of, of robots and, and will autonomy take over our lives and our jobs and our capabilities. And like the one thing humans are actually good at is adaptation. And maybe that's the only thing we should focus on in terms of, you know, education and, you know, building up our next generation of leaders is like, how do you adapt to a rapidly changing environment? Because that's, that's the only thing humans are particularly good at training at and consistently iterating on. Because that's what's amazing, right? Like, that's the amazing thing about technology is you, you, like, unleash the internet and nobody knows what, why it's useful at first. And then all these people kind of create these beautiful platforms on top of it, like your show. Um, and that's where the value stems from. It's not because anybody was prescriptive about it. It's yeah. because you adapted to a platform that otherwise didn't exist and you, you created value out of it. Yeah, and like we say on the show a lot, we talk about the importance of taking content away from what we're saying right now and actually creating with it, making some sort of further impact with it. Right. So do you think we're alone in the cosmos? Um, you know, this is an interesting question, and I, I think about it on a couple aspects, which is I... I think so much of our feeling alone is about our, and like in general, our, our feelings around loneliness are about like a lack of communication, right? And so we're not great at communicating with each other as people. Like you and I have great rapport and it's lovely to chat with you. Um, and you know, I feel less alone because I have a fiance who I feel like understands me and we have great connection. Mm -hmm. and. I feel not alone when I'm out in nature because I feel a level of connection and interface when I'm either mountain biking or skiing where I feel like it does feel like a conversation, right? It's on a different context. And so the way that I think about um, whether or not we're alone is I don't think we're alone, but I'm not sure if we carry the capacity currently to exchange in a meaningful way with larger and larger sim systems that, that might have forms of communication but maybe exist on waveforms or timelines or perspectives that we'll, we lack the capacity, right? Like, do weather systems communicate? Um, do planets mm -hmm. communicate? Do stars? Mm -hmm. um, 
it's easy to say no because that's an, that's an easier and a trivial answer. Uh, but it's more interesting to think about like, well, flowers give pollen to bees. Is that a form of communication? Um, yeah. And therefore, that are we separate or alone? And so, yeah. so I don't know that I think about like aliens on other planets um, because that that feels like such a that feels like such a, a, a in your face construct that's very much presented by Hollywood. And I think more about like you know what is a timeline or a time scale or like a magnitude of cosmos of um, I guess cognition or you know is is like does the universe have consciousness as a universe, as a planet, as a subsystem. And, and I think, you think, yeah? You know, I, I think that I have no data to the negative, and I have some potential of data towards the positive, right? Mm -hmm. That the, like you, you could potentially extrapolate how these are forms of, of consciousness and conversation and cognition. Do you think um, that we're in a computer simulation? Um, I think it's a really interesting question to consider, uh, particularly from, from the question of like, if we were in a computer simulation, do we have the technology to sample the time rate of that simulation to ever recognize that we're in one, right? Because that, that's like a, yeah. a basic question, which is, even if we were in a simulation, could, could we recognize it? Or is the timestamp of the simulation happening on a pace that's faster than, uh, so I think even if we're in a computer simulation, like that's fine. I, like, I enjoy this reality. It's a great deal of fun. It's pretty good. It's tactical. I can move things around mm -hmm. in it. Um, uh, and so I'm not sure it matters. <laughs> I think uh, there are ways to interpret simulation theory that make it matter, definitely, um, for another show. Um, then I would love to have that debate with you. Good. Well, we will. Um, then, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Um, God, there's so many beautiful things in the world. I, you know, I, I'm, I've never been a person that's all that geared towards lists or, but I think that the most beautiful feeling of the world is that moment that everybody hopefully experiences of like, true elation where like whatever it is and it's, it's usually something that's like very fleeting but that sense of joy that just kind of shows up because like you decided to show up and be present and yeah. actually notice something that's great um and i think that the thing that i find really beautiful about that is there's no barrier to experiencing that right mm -hmm. like you don't have to look a particular way or have a certain amount of money or whatever true. it's like that sense of being present and noticing what's around you, um, that for me is the most beautiful thing. Yeah, I love how it's democratized across everyone. It's just that feeling. Yeah, right, yeah. and it's like that childlike sense of wonder. And I think the thing that is really inspiring is to look at somebody who looks nothing like you, has a completely different background that you probably speak no words in common with, and you can see that emotion on their face, right? Because it's like in their eyes and in the way they carry themselves. And it's these fleeting moments and that is like true connection. You rock. <laughs> Hardly. Well said. Um, well thank said. you, Alan. This Mariana was such Franco. a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, Derek. We greatly appreciate it you. It was my pleasure. Um, we look forward to more great conversations together. That would be fun. Yeah. Um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. Sorry for all the tangents. The, the, we, we had a good amount of tangents, but we came back to almost everything quite well. I, I'm, very, I'm very impressed. It was good. Good conversation, good dialogue. <laughs> um, you're very polymathic, which is that's where all the tangents come from. That's, uh, and it's, uh, it's good to keep up. It feels good. You know, my brain's activated, <laughs> you know. Um, we didn't start with enough coffee today. <laughs> Everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. If you had a good time, definitely give a comment below with your thoughts. Subscribe, join the family, give the share. Um, talk to other people about it. Go write about it. Go make a video about it. Uh, maybe start a project in one of these fields. So go create with the content. Uh, 
Also, join us on Patreon so we can continue supporting the studio, uh, so we can continue growing the endeavor, impacting more people, get access to uh, VIP seating, get access to um, exclusive content, and uh, get access to join the production with us. So we'd love to have you join us. And thank you, Ron Vargas, our producing partner. Greatly Thanks, appreciate Ron. it. And we'll see you guys soon. Thank you.